All right, welcome to another episode of HealthSpan Academy. I am your host, Craig Shearhart, and joining me today is Dr. Nishi Bhopal, who is a sleep medicine uh, specialist and a psychiatrist. Nishi started her academic career with a bachelor's of science in biology at University of British Columbia and went on to complete med school at University Cork College in Ireland, and then went on to complete her psychiatry residency from Waite Stain University School of Medicine, went on to complete her sleep medicine fellowship at Harvard Medical School, and then became board certified in psychiatry, sleep medicine, and integrative holistic medicine. And then became founder of a private practice in California known as Pacific Integrative Psychiatry, and then went on to become founder of Intra Balance, which is an online platform for education on basically helping people with their sleep and mental well-being, um, which is actually how I ran into her on the Instagram. Um, cool. And then we'll put a link to all these goodies for you guys in the show notes. Uh, Nisha, thanks, Nisha, thanks so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me. Cool. I want to start this chat with uh, very briefly kind of my own personal uh, history with sleep. I don't want to turn this into a let's help Craig session, but just as a background <laughs> of how I first started paying attention to sleep. Um, like I was kind of the typical young adult, like just sort of bypass sleep is like something I do when I'm dead. And in grad school, I was doing eight different things, lucky to get like five hours of sleep a night. I was like, whatever, <laughs> I'll work out and be healthy other ways. And, um, and the turning point for me was when I heard a podcast, uh, with Dr. Matthew Walker, I'm not sure if you're familiar with him, but he was on Peter Atia, and it was a three-parter and it got pretty scientific. And some of the stuff kind of went over my head at the time, but it was enough info for me to realize that you can't cheat sleep. And that kind of maybe sort of start to pay attention to this stuff. Um, and so we know a lot of the dangers with sleep. We know it impairs cognitive function. It impairs, it leads to obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, dementia. Um, after being around this for the longest time, what worries you or what should we be most worried about if we're not consistently getting a good sleep? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I just want to say, like, I can completely relate to to that, to kind of making sleep, you know, the last priority, the last yeah. thing on your list. And I really struggled with that when I was in university. And I saw so many of my patients, I was going through um, medical training. And, you know, in medical training, we don't get a lot of sleep, yeah. right? So as doctors, you know, a lot of us are chronically sleep deprived. But, sure. I, you know, they were coming into the psychiatric clinic. And they were struggling with uncontrollable depression or anxiety or even other health issues, like um, obesity or high blood pressure and things that you just couldn't get a handle on. And mm -hmm. one thing I noticed with them is that um, a lot of them were struggling with sleep issues. And so like right. 70 to 80 percent of people in a psychiatric clinic struggle with with sleep issues. And so I really wanted to understand how to help them. Fair and enough. so tying back to your question of, you know, what are some of the issues that we should look out for? So we do know that, um, you know, sleep deprivation or poor quality sleep. So we can kind of divide sleep issues into those two main camps. So, you know, there's, you know, intentional sleep deprivation, so bedtime mm -hmm. procrastination, staying up too late. Um, that has similar issues as, you know, chronic issues with poor quality sleep that you might have from, you know, chronic insomnia or sleep apnea. Right. And so we know that, that these conditions can lead to metabolic issues. So there's a higher risk of type 2 diabetes, higher mm -hmm. risk of heart disease and stroke. Right. Um, but there's also a higher risk of just kind of like difficulty losing weight and, um, right. you know, uh, long-term issues with obesity, but from a brain health standpoint, which is, you know, something that I work with and emotional health is what mm -hmm. I work with in my practice. Um, there's a bi-directional relationship with sleep issues and mental health. So people will also have a higher risk of depression or, um, treatment resistant depression or anxiety. Um, and there's also a higher risk of, as you mentioned, dementia later in life. So, and, you know, we can talk about why that might be and some of the things that happen during sleep, but, you know, as far as like, what should the listener be concerned about? I think it also comes back to what you're predisposed to. Right. So if you have a family history of heart disease, that might mm -hmm. be a bigger concern for you right. versus if, if you personally are struggling with depression. You just so, increase you know, your sleep risk. Is such, yeah, exactly. Right. So it's such a personal thing. Everyone's affected by it differently. Fair enough. Cool. Um, Obviously, the, the pandemic plays a bit of a factor here now. Um, I feel like no matter who you are, maybe there's a few that have been possibly impacted, but I think most of us are probably in another camp uh, working our way through a pandemic. What are some of the challenges that you've seen clinically uh, and, and how do you start to work with people um, through some of those issues that you see through the pandemic? The pandemic's been really interesting because, as you said, there is a camp of people who have actually done pretty well, mm -hmm. uh, you know, working from home. And there's actually some people who are getting more sleep during the pandemic. So, yeah. you know, it's not been 
bad across the board for everybody. But, you know, at baseline, most people are sleep deprived. So here in the U.S., about a third of Americans are sleep deprived at baseline. Um, you know, that's just kind of part of the culture here. Right. And as you said, sleep wasn't really a priority before. There was this phrase, you know, I'll sleep and I'm dead. Mm-hmm. Um, in the past 10 years, you know, there's been a lot more attention on sleep. And I think yeah. especially during the pandemic, people right. are seeing um, what an impact it has on so many aspects of life. Mm-hmm. So one of the biggest problems that I see with people is that there's really no routine for those of us working from home, myself included. Right. Um, so a lot of my patients are um, working in tech. I'm here in the San Francisco Bay Area. So, you know, people have kind of shifted their work to home. And so mm-hmm. our regular routines have kind of been thrown out the window. Yeah. You know, we don't have that morning commute. Um, you, know, you know, sometimes you don't have to wake up to an alarm. You don't get that bright sunshine in the morning. Yeah. You're not getting up and getting dressed right. and having breakfast and maybe going to the gym and like doing all of these things that you might have done before. You're kind of just rolling out of bed blends, and, blends together well whole day is one yeah. big blur you yeah. might not even change your quote you know it's stretchy pants all day yeah so um yeah so that's one of the biggest things because our circadian rhythm really thrives on routines mm-hmm. and so when we don't have those routines it can really throw our sleep wake cycle out of right. whack right fair enough so I feel like one of the other things the pandemic's brought is like this <laughs> spending more time on on the screen and uh we're, we're hearing more about the dangers of blue light and how it basically changes our almost has similar impact to the sun. It just, it's, it's like sunlight shining on us late at night where it forces us kind of in that awake state. Um, what is your take on that? I've heard limit like things where we just need to limit it at night. Some people are saying we need to limit it altogether and try to get off the screen as much as we can. There's been work, like mistering or I'd say correlative studies like cancer. I don't know if we know if it's, it's causative, but, um, what what are the major things we should worry about with blue light and how do, how do we start to mitigate that? This is such an interesting question because I think this is an area where maybe some of the recommendations of, about blue light have kind of exceeded the science so far. Right. Um, so, you know, it's blue light's kind of like the new gluten, you know, <laughs> like everyone should avoid, avoid yeah, yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's kind of I'm gotten a bad free. rap. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> right, yeah. exactly. Yeah. yeah, 30 days of blue light free. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so, you know, so blue light, it's, it's not all bad. And, you know, as you said, um, blue light is what we're exposed to during the day. Mm-hmm. Um, so blue light is the short wavelength. And so that's, that's kind of daylight. Daylight mm-hmm. is blue light. Mm-hmm. And um, screens also emit blue light. So it's not just the light itself that is problematic, but the timing of the light is important, but also layering onto that, the activity that you're doing on your blue light emitting device is important as well, Mm -hmm. right? So it's not just as simple as like, okay, let's just avoid blue light and our sleep will, you know, magically improve. Um, You really want to be intentional about um, the timing that you're being exposed to blue light. So, you know, I'll just kind of... um, explain, you know, like the flip side of it is that blue light can actually be very therapeutic. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when we're treating things like uh, seasonal affective disorder or even, you know, unipolar depression, so um, depression that's not seasonal or or bipolar, Mm -hmm. um, and even in bipolar depression, blue light can actually be uh, an effective treatment. Um, So we use bright light therapy um, in certain situations. So so light is not all bad. Um, Mm -hmm. So I just want to make that um, point clear. But okay, so then what do we do about blue light? Should you limit it at night or, you know, what should you do? So a good rule of thumb is to, you know, don't worry about the blue light during the day, but after about 7 p.m., that's when you can start to dim your um, brightness on your screens. Right. You can use, um, you know, blue light filtering apps like mm-hmm. Flux, um, you know, use the night shift feature. Um, and also just be mindful as well about what you're doing on the screen, as mm-hmm. I mentioned before. Right. Uh, so. You know, so if you're scrolling through social media or you're checking your work email um, or you're doing things that are going to kind of activate your nervous system, that's Mm -hmm. not going to be good for you. Even if you're doing that with your blue light blocking glasses on, right? Right. Like that's still going to have an effect on you. So, you know, you want to be mindful about what you're doing as well. Right. On the note of blue light glasses, I just very recently, I didn't do any research on my own. Just someone told me that they don't work or something. And I assume it's kind of dependent on the brand or the type or like is is there something you should look for to, when you're getting a good pair and what can like how much of a of a difference can they make yeah so you know that's an interesting question too because you know again it's not just the the 
the blue light from the screen that could have an impact. And that mm-hmm. might be why they don't work. I'm actually not a proponent of blue light glasses. I, I don't think that most people need them. Right. Um, and, you know, if you look at the research, what happens with blue light is that it might make it slightly longer to fall asleep. So most of the studies show that, you know, exposure to blue light in the evening might increase your sleep latency by maybe like four to 10 minutes. Okay. So it's actually not a, not having a huge impact on how long it takes you to fall asleep. Right. What it can do, though, is it can affect your melatonin production. Mm. So it can delay the onset of your um, melatonin production in the evening. Right. And if you're using blue light consistently, so um, consistently meaning like one and a half hours, you know, several days in a row, that can really start to have an impact on your circadian rhythm right. and your uh, timing of your melatonin production. Right. Um, so again, you know, you want to go back to, um, you know, minimizing that light, minimizing the time that you're spending on your devices. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, blue light blocking glasses might be an additional sort of like helpful adjunct to that, right. but you really want to start with the behaviors. Right. That makes a lot of sense. Cool. Um, let's talk a little bit about what most people are doing on their, on their blue light devices, which is scrolling through social media. And you kind of talked about the issue of, what you're doing on the device is, is important. And we've seen studies, at least I saw one on teens where that shows like a direct correlation between how much screen time we have on social media and me- mental health. Um, is that something that you're seeing with adults? Is that something we should worry about or how, like, do you have a strategy you recommend for people on how to digest social media? Yeah, no, this, this is a big issue. And yeah, we're hearing a lot about this with like eating disorders and things in, mm-hmm. in adolescence. But yeah, it does affect adults as well. And, you know, uh, I was looking at some stats here and it's, I found that approximately 21% of adults wake up to check their phone during the night. And mm. it's been, yeah, wow. so it's a pretty big, you know, like a fifth of people are doing this. We're just and, like slaves um, to, the, to the screen. That's, 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 totally that's, that's terrifying. Wow. Right? Huh. Yeah. And, you know, like to think that, you know, maybe 15, 20 years ago, we didn't even have these devices. Yeah. So it's really changed the way that we kind of go through our day. Totally. Um, yeah. Wow. And so another interesting aspect of this is that it's been found that people who experience more FOMO, fear of missing out, mm. are more likely to check their social media um, within 15 minutes of going to sleep right. or during their sleep zone. I can't be the last one to see this TikTok video of this cat eating right. this cake. <laughs> like, right. yeah, that's, that's hilarious. Well, I was a little sad, but also right. kind of funny. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And so, yeah. And, you know, and I think the pandemic hasn't helped with this, right? Because mm-hmm. we're, many of us are isolated. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we're kind of in our little box, you know, with the same four walls that we're looking right. at every day. So social media can be an escape. And so, you know, what I see in my practice is that people are kind of using social media more compulsively. Mm. So it's an opportunity to have a conversation with people about, okay, you know, are you feeling disconnected? Are you feeling anxious? Like, what Mm. is this really a symptom of? And can we get to the root of that and find some other strategies to kind Mm. of manage your mental health so that you're not engaging in these um, platforms that are actually designed to keep you scrolling, right? right? Like they're designed to keep you in a flow state. So once yeah, you get started, it's, it's hard to break out of that pattern. Totally. You're just getting rewarded for the more <laughs> you, yep. you use yep. it. It's nuts. Yeah. Um, yeah. That dopamine just keeps on flowing. Yeah. That's crazy. And I, I feel like this is pretty specific person to person, how you're using it. I I've noticed a big difference, even just turning off notifications. So you're not like a complete slave over here. I'm here a ding. Yep. Someone liked my picture. <laughs> you, <laughs> you run into it. Um, but that's, that's good advice. I think uh, just kind of monitoring it. Um, let's talk about mouth breathing. This is something I, I first really became aware of when I was like in the cardiovascular world, like in athletes, they, they found that training with uh, the mouth closed help with, um, competition, basically capacity and, and, uh, aerobic capacity and sort of, uh, in endurance sports. Um, and I know that it's sort of a precursor to snoring and potentially sleep apnea. Maybe you can talk about all three of these, how they're related and, um, and how damaging is mouth breathing to our overall function and sleep habits? Yeah. So, so nose breathing is very beneficial. You know, mm-hmm. as you mentioned, like if you're training, um, you know, as an athlete, of course, but it's helpful for your performance. But even if you're not an athlete, um, mm-hmm. nose breathing during the day is actually very calming. And there's a few reasons for that. So one is when you're breathing through your nose, the air is being properly filtered, you know, mm-hmm. through through your airway. And one thing that happens is there's a release of nitric oxide, and that can help to reduce your heart rate and your blood pressure. 
Hmm. So I like to think of things in terms of, you know, sympathetic versus parasympathetic nervous right. system. I think that's just, it's, it's a simple framework, but I think mm-hmm. it's really useful to understand mm-hmm. things like this. So, you know, a really simple way to look at it is that when you're mouth breathing, that can activate your sympathetic nervous system, right. which is your fight, flight, or freeze response. Mm-hmm. Because if you think about like, if you're, um, you know, running away from something, whether you're exercising or you're running away from danger, or that you're more likely to breathe your mouth. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So it's telling your your brain and your body that, okay, there's run some faster. sort of yeah. stressor. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, run fast, get away yeah. from that tiger or whatever. Yeah. And and then the parasympathetic nervous system is your rest and digest mm-hmm. aspect of your nervous system. So when you're in a calm state, you know, your your face is relaxed and you're breathing through your nose. Right. So it's just a, a simple kind of construct. Mm-hmm. So, you know, the connection to sleep apnea is that what happens during sleep apnea is that people start breathing through their mouth at night. That's one mm-hmm. of the, the signs and, and symptoms mm-hmm. because um, there may be some obstruction in the airway where they're just not able to get enough air through their nose. So they end up breathing through their mouth. Um, right. And uh, what can happen is then, you know, with untreated sleep apnea, it can lead to some of those issues we talked about at the top of this episode mm-hmm. in terms of like obesity and metabolic issues and increased risk of high blood pressure and stroke and, and so forth. Mm-hmm. So if somebody's mouth breathing during the day, that may be a, a sign that there might be some sort of airway obstruction to look into, and that mm-hmm. could be affecting their sleep at night. Right potentially even building muscle memory. Does that make sense? You're sort of reinforcing the muscles that breathe Mm -hmm. through your mouth as opposed to your nose. Interesting. Yeah. Um, Yeah. You can actually like train and sort of tone the, the airway uh, musculature. Right. Interesting. Um, Yeah. So my, my sort of father-in-law has dealt with pretty severe sleep apnea and we see the effects directly. Like he's got some mental health issues as a result and really based when, when years being undiagnosed Um, the, what we've heard in the clinic is basically once you've got sleep apnea that you're, and you've started on a CPAP that you're on it for life. Is there any way to, is there an alternative to that? Or, or do we, is there other methods, maybe a way to weed yourself off of it? Or are you basically using it for life? Yeah. So, so CPAP is not, doesn't have to be a life sentence. It really depends on what the cause of the sleep apnea is. Mm-hmm. So, you know, for people, for many people, sleep apnea may be related to weight. Um, so if you're overweight or if you have a large neck, that mm-hmm. just predisposes you to more airway collapse and obstruction right. when you're sleeping. So I have patients where they know sleep apnea is coming on when they gain weight and then they mm-hmm. lose weight and then they're good and then they gain weight. They go back huh. in their CPAP and they lose weight and they're good. So it can kind of be this ebb and flow sort of thing. Right. Um, for, for some people though, sleep apnea may not be weight related. Right. Um, and, and this is a really important point because, you know, I'll have patients in my clinic who are maybe, um, Thin, you know, they've never struggled with weight before. Um, they're not, the, they don't look like the classic picture of someone you would think of when you think of sleep apnea. Mm-hmm. And I'll talk to them about sleep apnea and they're like, no, I don't have that. I'm not overweight. And, and, you know, it's important to recognize that, you know, it may be structural. So some people just have a very narrow airway. Right. Um, so there, there could be a structural issue or there may be some other obstructive issues like a deviated septum right. or large t- tonsils or even a tongue mm-hmm. that's larger you know, in proportion to their mouth that could be obstructing their airway when they sleep. Right. So, you know, for, for people who are experiencing those types of things, sometimes surgical interventions can be helpful. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, CPAP can be helpful as well. Um, And, you know, for some people, they, they will need to use CPAP um, long-term if it is something that can't be corrected. But, um, you know, the, the short answer is that, you know, there are alternatives to CPAP. Other things include an oral appliance. Okay. So that, looks like a retainer and you wear that in your mouth and it, it kind of pulls your jaw forward and it opens up the airway. Oh, interesting. Hmm. So, yeah, so that can cool. be useful as well. And then there's other things that, that are kind of being um, designed, uh, you know, that are alternatives to CPAP, but right now CPAP is still the gold standard treatment. Fair enough. Awesome. Um, I want to talk about, you kind of talked about obesity that kind of brings me into to diet. And we know that what's interesting is that it seems like diet can impair your sleep and sleep impairs your diet. Like it's almost like what's the the chicken and egg thing going on. And I've heard a little bit of a mix. I've heard more recent stuff that says we don't need to completely fast right before sleep. Like some calories are okay. I guess depends what it is. Um, 
what do you typically recommend or should we be taking a few hours of just not eating at all right before bed or, or what do you, what's, what do you find works best? Yeah, this, this is one of those things too, where a really personalized approach is important because mm-hmm. there's no one size fits all right. um, sort of solution sure. for this. And the, the data is constantly changing. And yeah. I think that's why it's so confusing, right? Yeah. Cause like you read something in the news one week and then next week, the next week is something totally different. Yeah. Um, but you know, as you said, with sleep, a lot of issues with sleep, whether we're talking about diet or mood or, you know, metabolic issues, there is a bi-directional relationship. So, mm. you know, sleep will affect um, your food intake and then food intake affects your sleep. Mm-hmm. So kind of looking at that a little bit more closely, um, what happens when you're sleep deprived or you're getting poor quality sleep is that it can affect your hunger hormones, right. um, specifically ghrelin and leptin. So mm. ghrelin makes you feel more hungry. The way I remember that is like your stomach is growling, so you have more <laughs> ghrelin. And then leptin um, is what's released when you are satiated. So when you've had enough right. to eat, it kind of helps you feel full. Yeah. So ghrelin levels go up when you're sleep deprived. So it's going to make you more hungry. Mm. Um, and then your leptin levels go down. So you're going to feel like you need to eat more to feel satisfied. Right. And so it's going to put you Double at risk sword. of double-edged sword and it's going to put you at risk for reaching in the afternoon for you know a bag of chips or Mm -hmm. box of cookies or whatnot rather than an apple so that's Mm -hmm. that's just one way that sleep can affect your your food choices but on the flip side you know how do your food choices affect your sleep so there is data showing that an increased risk of high glycemic index foods so very like sugary foods Mm -hmm. and also high saturated fat um, foods can actually cause more nighttime awakenings and reduce deep sleep Mm-hmm. And then foods that are higher in fiber and that are unprocessed. So, you, you know, you can think about like a Mediterranean diet um, that is high in fruits and vegetables and um, fiber and healthy fats mm-hmm. are associated with more restorative sleep and fewer nighttime awakenings and more deep sleep. Right. So, you know, thinking about those macronutrients and, and how you're taking in those nutrients is, is really um, impactful mm-hmm. on your sleep quality. And then micronutrients are important to think about as well. Right. And, um, you know, so if you've got vitamin D deficiency or even subclinical, um, suboptimal rather levels of, of vitamin D or suboptimal levels of vitamin B12 or iron, um, all of these ma- micronutrients are important for synthesis of neurotransmitters that are involved right. in sleep and hormones that are involved in sleep. And so if you have suboptimal levels of these things, that can also impact your sleep quality. Um, And then timing of sleep as uh, of food, rather, as you mentioned, is important. Mm -hmm. So it's a good idea to avoid a very heavy meal within three hours of going to bed. Yeah. um, Because that can increase your risk of of acid reflux, which Mm. then can even increase your risk of sleep apnea. So there's a correlation between those two things. Right. (laughs) Right? Right. So it's all tied together. But if you do tend to get hungry, if you wake up in the middle of the night and and you you can't sleep because there's your stomach's growling or you're very hungry or your blood sugar might be low. Um, you can have a snack about an hour before bed, something that is um, high in complex carbohydrates. So like okay. a handful of nuts is a good idea or like yeah. some hummus with roasted vegetables or right. something like that. Okay. That's good to know. Let's talk a little bit about sleep tracking. I think this is kind of a rabbit hole. We could probably talk about the entire time and I can go and, and geek out about my whoop stats and all that stuff, um, <laughs> but it has been useful for for me, just uh, because I, I'm like a mad scientist with it, like I'll just as an experiment, I'll eat, you know, either dumpster fire or like fast for the night and just see what it does. <laughs> um, and uh, and I found it really useful. So, what do you have a go to recommendation? How valuable do you find measuring heart rate variability from like a, a, a clinical or, or coaching standpoint? This is one of those double-edged swords again, because it can be really useful. And, you know, I have my aura ring and yeah. I love it. And, <laughs> you know, and it gives me a lot of really great data. Right. Um, on the flip side though, uh, you know, what I, cause I'm a psychiatrist. So I see people who come to me for anxiety and depression. Mm-hmm. And what I see is that people can start to become a little bit compulsive or anxious right. about what's showing up on, yeah. on their data. And this is actually called orthosomnia where mm. people start becoming preoccupied with getting really good quality sleep and you know they're really analyzing all the data that's showing up on their device so that's just something to be cautious about um so you want to you know use these devices intentionally and i do find the heart rate variability tracking really useful and even personally um like i like to see okay 
what does my data look like, you know, when I've meditated, you know, so mm-hmm. many days in a row right. or like when I've exercised or like what time I've exercised or, yeah. you know, how long did I take my dog for a walk? Like <laughs> just yeah. to see how those markers show Experiments up. Experiments are endless. Um, it's, it's, experimentation. Yeah. <laughs> it's super fun. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so, you know, so heart rate variability um, is basically a marker of how well your body adapts to stress. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, this ties back to what we were talking about before with the parasympathetic yeah. and sympathetic nervous system. Mm-hmm. So when you're in a parasympathetic dominant state, um, you have higher heart rate variability. Right. And then when you're in a stress state, sympathetic dominance, you have lower heart rate variability. Right. Um, and so when you get better sleep, you have higher heart rate variability. So it's a, it's a really useful marker. Um, but you want to make sure that when you are looking at this data, that you're comparing the data to your own and that you're right. not comparing it to your yeah. partner. Because, yeah, because yeah. my husband will be like, oh, let, let me look at your data. I'm like, no, that, <laughs> it doesn't work that way. Like, you yeah, can't compare between individuals. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Fair enough. That's good to know. Um, really quickly before we move on to that, I just want to get your thoughts on um, blood pressure variability. Because I, I really hadn't thought of this, but uh, my guest last week is an exercise uh, physiologist. And he was like, heart rate variability is like, not not as indicative of like your variability in, in blood pressure. And I guess that's a better sign that we're in a parasympathetic state. Do you have a, a comment or take on that? Yeah, blood, so blood pressure variability is something that normally happens when we sleep, actually. Right. So there's a phenomenon called, called dipping of blood pressure that happens during sleep. Mm-hmm. So when you're getting good quality sleep, your blood pressure should go down. Um, and then, you know, kind of increases during the day when you're awake. Mm-hmm. And so when you're getting poor quality sleep or insufficient sleep, your blood pressure doesn't have a chance to dip. Right. So that kind of can cause um, a chronically elevated uh, baseline blood right. pressure. Huh. Um, so, you know, so I see this with patients of mine who, you know, they're not coming to me for issues with blood pressure, but I'll see they're on like maybe two or three different blood pressure medications mm-hmm. and um, they haven't really addressed sleep piece. And in some cases that can also be a sign of, of untreated sleep apnea. Right. Um, so yeah, so there is that kind of correlation with sleep quality. Fair enough. That's good to know. Um, let's talk a little bit about, so suppose we don't have our fancy gadget or whoop or our aura ring. Um, and besides just like feeling tired, what are the other kind of warning signs, uh, like mood? What are the, the things you tell people to watch out for if they're not sleeping well and they don't have a device? Yeah. So, you know, things to look out for are mood, um, Mm -hmm. irritability. Mm -hmm. um, Are you just more cranky? Are you more snappy with your partner? Um, But subtle things can be, um, you know, having issues at work. So sometimes interpersonal issues at work could be Mm -hmm. a a subtle sign or just making careless mistakes. Um, So typos in your emails or forgetting to follow up on things, Hmm. Um, you know, starting to, you know, run late with tasks and deadlines. Those can be subtle signs of sleep deprivation. Um, The hunger, you know, we talked about before. So if you're craving more carbs or you're craving more salty things or really sweet things, that could also be a sign. Hmm. Um, But then another another sort of obvious sign is a feeling a need to sleep in on the weekends. Right. So, you know, if you're getting up at 6 a.m. on work days and then you're sleeping till 10 on a weekend, that's a sign that you're not getting enough sleep yeah. during the week. Yeah, that's fair enough. That's good advice. Let's talk quickly about the ideal sleeping environment. Um, I've heard, I think feel like everybody has their own kind of take on what the ideal is. And I've, I've heard a few different strategies. Generally, they say that cold temperature is better. We need to distance ourselves from devices. Uh, we need to minimize light and use blackout curtains if we can. Get a comfortable mattress. What do you what? So, if we can fix one thing, what would you say is the lowest hanging fruit for somebody? If if like I personally cannot stand a cold room, <laughs> that's probably going to be my last thing <laughs> that I, I adjust. Uh, I, I assume it's somewhat personalized, but in terms of effect, what do you feel like is the biggest impact on people? Yeah. So one of the things that I really talk to people about is ventilation in their okay. room. Hmm. Um, and the, the, the reason I talk about this is because I had a patient who came to me for um, having sleep issues for years. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and again, you know, she couldn't get a handle on it. And so I go through, you know, it's sort of a checklist when I'm seeing a patient. Um, and, we, you know, we kind of go through everything with regard to sleep. And so one of the things I ask about is tell me about your bedroom and, and the mm-hmm. setup. And it turned out that she um, lives in a very small studio apartment in San Francisco. We have small spaces here. And she was sleeping in her closet because there was no other rooms, right? It was a small studio. So she's like, okay, I'll just make a little bedroom in my closet. 
So she mm. was sleeping in this sort of dark and stuff. I mean, dark is good, but like this stuffy, tiny little room where there was no ventilation, no, no windows. That and she could hardly terrible. breathe oh my in there, right? I know it sounds awful. And so, you so know, that's I what not her, to do. Don't, don't put yourself in an unventilated yeah. closet. Don't sleep in a stuffy closet. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, you know, so I had her move the bedroom out of that closet and put okay. it next to a window. And then right. literally overnight, her sleep started to improve. So this is something that people often forget about is think about the cleanliness of your room and the ventilation. Cause mm-hmm. if you're not breathing properly, if it's dusty or stuffy mm-hmm. and it's just not enough air circulation, that is going to have a direct impact on your sleep quality. So right. I would start with that. Um, and then you can start to layer in, you know, uh, there's sort of three C's that I talk about. So your room should be clean, calming, and cool. Okay. Um, so start with the clean, make it calming. Um, so that involves, you know, reducing your light exposure, taking mm-hmm. out devices that might be distracting or impacting mm-hmm. your mental health mm-hmm. um, and your stress levels. And then cool. So yeah, I mean, everyone has their own preferences. They say like 16 to 19 Celsius or 60 to 65 Fahrenheit, 60 to 67 Fahrenheit. Um, is ideal, but that's going to be different for everybody. Right. Fair enough. That's great. Um, let's talk quickly about, we've talked a little bit about food. Um, in my own experience, I know caloric restriction and intermittent fasting has been like the biggest indicator. Like if I eat like a heavy carb meal, I'm in the red guaranteed the next day. Uh, (laughs) if I, if I fast, I'm almost always in the green and it's, um, so what, is quality, would you, if you, is quality more important than quality? Like when I say quality, nutrient dense, minimally processed versus like just getting too many calories, like what is it just somewhere in the middle? How do you start to prioritize that? Yeah. And you know, again, this is one of those things that's really personal. So, you know, I generally recommend starting with good quality food. Mm -hmm. So if you are eating, you know, a lot of processed things or things that are just very, you know, calorie dense, but not very rich in nutrients, that's a good place to start. Mm -hmm. Start introducing more of those high fiber foods that increase your deep sleep and and can increase the quality of your sleep. And then start to think about the timing of your food. Um, And this is where eating hygiene comes in. Um, And so I actually just released a video on eating hygiene on my YouTube channel um, because how you eat can be just as important as what you're Mm. eating. Um, And it it ties back again to the parasympathetic nervous system and kind of slowing down and chewing your food properly so your Mm. body can digest it and assimilate those nutrients and it can promote a healthy microbiome. It's all interconnected. But um, intermittent fasting can be really, really effective for some people and Mm -hmm. for others it can just totally throw them out of whack. So I really encourage my patients and, and, you know, you know, people who might be listening to tune into your body right? and because your body will tell you what it needs, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and you can use, um, just sort of subtle signs of, of sleep quality as a marker, or if you have your device, your aura ring, or your your loop, you can use those to help you gauge. Yeah. Right. That's good to know. Um, I want to circle back to your own habits and I'm sure like, I feel like everybody's a little bit stressed out and it's when, and when you coach this stuff it's almost tougher to kind of keep yourself accountable sometimes because you can kind yep. of take in all different directions talk about yep. your own habits and health and fitness and mobility and uh, stretching and meditation do you have a routine that you stick to or what do your priorities look like around your own personal health fitness and, and well-being yeah one of my um sort of things that i've really gotten into in the past year or so is self-compassion Um, because, you know, as we were discussing with the pandemic, a lot of our regular routines have been thrown out the window and I've been Mm -hmm. working from home and, um, you know, I can be a little bit of a perfectionist sometimes and, and, uh, fall into some of those, those traps of, of feeling like I'm not doing enough. I'm not being productive enough and and getting into these kind of like thought cycles that are just really not helpful. Mm -hmm. So for me, Daily uh, practices of self-compassion and gratitude has been really helpful. So just what that looks like is like starting my day with an intention Mm -hmm. of how I want to go through that day Um, and not putting too much pressure on myself to, you know, get a million things done. Right. And so starting with that actually has been really helpful for me. Um, And then I also typically do a breathing practice in the morning. So it's a yoga practice called Kriya Yoga, Mm -hmm. um, which is based in pranayama. So it's breathing related. So I do that in the morning um, before I get started. And that's a really great way to to set the tone for the day. Um, 
and then I'm on Zoom all day. And so I've kind of built in some some sort of like strategies to manage being on on a screen all day. So right. what I do is after every patient, I get up and I, I do some kind of quick stretch. So I might do a couple squat squats or I might touch my toes or like stretch my arms over my head, have nice. a sip of water, but I make sure I, I, I stand up and my aura ring reminds me to do that as nice. well. Um, and then, and then I build in my, my evening routine because I don't have my commute anymore. My commute is going up and down the stairs in the house. So, nice. <laughs> so I kind of have, have built in, um, you know, uh, a routine that involves dimming the lights after 7 PM. We actually have our, our dimmers on a timer oh, now smart. with our Alexa. So Very it just nice. happens automatically. Yeah. That's great. Um, you know, making sure I have my, my dinner early enough, um, building in some time for exercise or taking my dog out and just kind of trying to stick to as much of a routine as I can. But again, mm -hmm. not beating myself up if it's not perfect. Right. That's great. Awesome. Well, Nisha, this has been a fantastic chat. I really appreciate your time. Like I said, we'll put a link to all your, uh, your uh, websites and, and how people can get in touch with you after the show. Um, hopefully we can do this again sometime, maybe when we're not in a pandemic, when we're we can <laughs> not, not stuck on Zoom all day long. <laughs> That would be cool. great. Thank you so much. Awesome. All right, guys. Thanks for tuning in to HealthSpan Academy and we'll see you next time.